And welcome to our hybrid worship service. I'm Peggy Jenkins. I'm part of the worship committee responsible for summer services at the UUCP this year. We are excited to put together hybrid services for people both in our building and at home. It is all a work in progress, and we are interested in knowing what people think. We preface our service by acknowledging that the land on which our homes and our church were built was not uninhabited when European settlers arrived here with their ideas of conquest and ownership. For those of us who live in Moscow, Pullman, or other nearby communities, we live on the ancestral home of the Nimipu, called Nez Perce by the French speaking traders, the Palouse, and the Shishumt, called the Coeur d'Alene. If you are joining us from another place, I encourage you to discover who inhabited and moved through the place where you now live in the times before colonization and genocide, and where they are now. We pause and remember that we live on ground that is sacred, ground that was stolen, ground that cries out for justice and for responsible stewardship. May our remembering help us find the courage to do our part to restore wholeness to the earth and all her peoples. We also pause for just a moment to light a candle and pray for peace. We hold in our hearts all of those currently threatened by greed and imperialism, from the people in the Ukraine to those in Somalia, and people in Gallup, New Mexico, and Los Angeles injured and killed in violent car crashes this week. And we recommit ourselves to nurturing peace, peace in the world and peace within. And now, let us say our words of welcome together. Welcome to you, old friends and new, young and old. You are an essential part of our celebration today, whether today is your first or your thousandth Sunday in our midst. We are stronger because you are with us. We are one people of many beliefs, identities, origins, sexualities, and genders. We are all growing, all learning, all loved. Body, mind, heart, and spirit, just as you are, you are welcome here. We are hoping some of the folks joining us via Zoom have a chalice or a candle to light and something to light it with. Let's light our chalices together. Say the words with me of the chalice lighting affirmation. In the light of truth and the warmth of love, we gather to seek and seek to share. Now we are not going to sing uh, the, the song of aspiration um, because of COVID precautions that the UUC board approved in April for large gatherings, i.e. inside the church Sunday morning. 
people are requested to mask, distance, and refrain from eating, drinking, and singing together. So we'll listen to the Song of Aspiration. <laughs> Today we're exploring the 1990s. Just like every decade through all time, people's lived experiences were varied and unique, and it would be folly to generalize about what the 90s were for the people who lived them when they were living them. But now we can look back and ask, what were the common threads? What were the shared joys and triumphs? What were the threats and injustices we failed to notice? What can we learn? Come. Let us worship together. Our opening words are from Kurt Anderson, a former editor of Spy Magazine, in an opinion piece in the New York Times. What about the 1990s? Nostalgia for the era in which you were young is almost inevitable. So people born between 1970 and 1990 feel a natural fetishistic fondness for the decade. But even for the rest of us, the 90s provoke a unique species of lost time, not merely bittersweet reveling in the past of time. No, looking back at the final 10 years of the 20th century is grounds for genuine mourning. It was simply the happiest decade of our American lifetimes. This isn't mainly fogeyish on my part. No, it is empirically, objectively, Broadly true. Thank you. Children are invited to join the volunteers uh, in the uh, children's area for activities designed just for them. And now we'll, we'll, we won't sing the children out with the Reed Benediction. We'll listen to the Reed Benediction being sung. Now let's take a moment to engage in the practice of generosity together. For those of you able to make a financial contribution, the logistics are on your screen. We'd invite you to either copy down the information you need or simply go to the website to make a donation. The web address is in the chat. Those of you who are newer or visiting from another part of the country may not be aware that we typically give all our cash from our Sunday offerings to local charities whose missions align with our values. It's a program called the Month of Sundays. This month, the recipient is the Boost Collaborative Children and Family Support Services. Based in Pullman, Boost Collaborative is a community-based nonprofit organization devoted to improving the lives of individuals with disabilities and their families through Whitman and Lataw counties. If you are donating online, you can choose Month of Sundays from the drop-down menu if you are mailing or leaving a check with us here today, simply indicate in the memo line whether it is intended for the month of Sundays or for our general fund. In the spirit of love and for the continuing work of this church, we now take some time to practice generosity together.
lift up the joys and sorrows of the lives of our members and friends. In these transition times, we've asked folks to share their joys and sorrows with Ryan during the week, and we will make a slide and light a candle to share with the congregation on Sunday. This week, we only have a joy, which is nice. It is a candle of joy for Fran and Frank Rodriguez, who were married August 9, 1972. Fran says, 50 years and the adventure continues. We light one more candle for the joys and sorrows too tender to share. Life, however fragile, is a gift, and we in this community of memory, sharing, and hope celebrate this gift today and always. Now it's time for our meditation. So please sit back, still yourself, breathe deeply and with ease. Today, our meditation features words and music from Jonathan Larson. Jonathan was an amazingly promising Broadway composer, lyricist, and playwright who died suddenly in 1996 at the age of 35, the day before the off-Broadway premiere of his musical Rent was to open. Rent was to go on to play for 22 years in that theater to much acclaim and love these words are from a song in the musical. Pretty prescient, too. There is no future, there is no past. I live in this moment as my last. There's only us, there's only this. Forget regret or life is yours to miss. No other road, no other way, no day but today. She actually said there might be a riot if, if I didn't do that. <laughs> She said she would write. <laughs> yes. The words, the words from the, what was that song called? I don't. No, no day but today. Yeah, yeah. So. Okay, yeah, you're right. He had a brain aneurysm that was not, yeah. And there, and there, was, there may have been some malpractice involved. Um, no, no worries. Um, okay, so um, next we have our summer slideshow for the 90s. Our summer services exploring the decades with shared stories, pictures, and music continues today. In preparation for the service, I asked some folks in the congregation who came of age during the 90s to share their experiences and photos. We'll start with a slideshow of photos members shared with me and then offer some longer reflections as well. So you can tell who this is. Who's this? This is Amy Scott. And Amy's siblings, um, Charlie, Jason, and Mary, this is 1992. Mary looks just like, I think Mary looks just like her daughter. Um, and then uh, the next picture is Amy in 1999 at Fort Jackson in South Carolina. She was there for advanced individual training as a light wheel vehicle mechanic, which is a skill I don't think, uh, I don't think I was aware that Amy had, which is too bad. Um, with her is her friend Russ, who was teaching her how to play pool. Next, we have Carly Wicken Wickenhagen. She was five and living on a military base in California in 1990. She rode bikes a lot and did a 24 mile bike ride around the bay when she was five. Here she is at a 4th of July costume contest in Las Vegas, New Mexico around 1997. And, and then this picture, the next one is from 1994, shows a bunch of shoes that washed up on the beach in Marshfield, Massachusetts. Her dad and sister collected them as though they were fish. Next we have Ellen Peterson. She graduated from University of Pacific in Stockton, California in May 1992. There was a recession going on and no jobs to be had, so she moved back to Seattle. 
Then she moved to Moscow and she got a job, her first real job at Gritman. And she played, there she is at work, hard at work. And she also played for Gritman's competitive softball team. And she was, I think she's pretty good. She said the one word she would use to describe being a young adult in the 90s is carefree. Next, we've got Carol McFarlane. Uh, she's, she took some, scanned some pictures for us that were in a little bit of rough shape. Um, she, there's a picture of her in elementary school. She and her mom moved to Minnesota after parents, her parents split up and her mom went back to school to become a nurse. Then she moved to Montana with her family and in high school, she joined the speech team. I told her I was a speech nerd myself. Uh, she didn't say she was a nerd, but um, she said that the speech team saved her. She loved fitting in by not fitting in with all the other kids who didn't fit in, which I guess she did say they were nerds, um, which made it all okay and fun as, and awkward as we navigated our first overnights in hotels. I remember those. Uh, away from our parents. And then there's a photo of Carol when she was 15 and she went with her mom to a rainbow gathering in Missoula. And she said uh, it was so lovely to go. She went to three more subsequently and she found the peace and love vibes and the energetic drumming and dancing unforgettable and influential. So, and now Marissa has some slides and photos and memories to share, and I asked her if she would like to share them herself. I'm gonna pull it up on my phone so I can see what you're looking at here too. Oh, it's wrong thing. So um, I just wanna preface by saying that um, I know we're, we're talking about the 90s, and maybe I'll take this off. But um, I came into the 90s from kind of an unconventional background. So I started with, um, there's the picture of my parents um, getting married at Mount Rainier up in the corner there. They met in the summer of 1979 and knew each other for about two weeks when they decided to get married. Um, <laughs> My dad apparently said, I'm moving to Alaska, do you wanna go with me? And my mom said, only if we get married. So uh, that's the first photo. And then um, they did in fact move to Alaska where after living in a small windowless tool shed for a while, moved into this army surplus tent um, shown up there with the orange sled leaning against it. There's a stick holding up one end. It had a wood stove inside so you can see the the um, chimney with smoke coming out. They lived in this tent in the early 80s until they realized that they were discovering their first child, me. They were uh, expecting a baby, so they decided to build a house, which um, they built by hand themselves. I believe that's up there too, it's hard to see. Yeah, okay, so the snowy picture has their house up there. Uh, they had taken a class in the Seattle area before moving to Alaska on building cabins. And so they used their knowledge from the, the class they took to build that. And we lived there until 1988. And so um, the picture of the ferry, I believe is the actual ferry that my sister and mom and I moved in in, in the middle of 1988 called the Tustamina. And it was going to Seattle for some regular maintenance. So they had really cheap tickets because it was a commuter ferry not meant to carry people for like multi-day trips. So my mom had less than a dollar in her pocket when we left. My dad had left a few months earlier and got a job at Boeing in Seattle, and we joined him there. So this is the 80s, the leading up to the 90s. So um, just to give you context of my 90s experience. And once we moved to the Seattle area, we uh, moved in with my dad's mom, Velma Purdue, and we bought her house, which is up in the top left corner there in Auburn, Washington. It was a, um, you know, really, really suburban lifestyle that I was not familiar with or used to at all. It was really weird to suddenly be in a place where there were neighbors all around us in rigid street formations and 
we would go places with freeways and go over overpasses and buy brand new clothes at malls instead of thrift store hand-me-down things in the middle of nowhere. Um, and my sister and I are, there's a picture of us in probably like 1990, 1991 in swimsuits in our yard posing. We felt very cool having brand new clothes with like bright colors on them, which this photo is not very super clear, but they're like neon colors. And I've got a bikini top with floral print and probably actually went to like, uh, what's the hair place, the Sam's, Sam's, fantastic Sam's. So I got my bangs cut, feeling super cool. We thought that we were living like the high life or very worldly and cosmopolitan. Um, so there is another photo of me. It's kind of off center tilted and I'm at summer reading program with my, my pink headband and my pink glasses and my pink tank top there. I did a lot of reading as a kid because I didn't feel like I fit in very much. Um, and so I feel like I kind of retreated into books a lot. There was a lot of uh, historical fiction and fantasy books that I read because uh, they were not like my life and hours and hours and hours a day reading or hanging out at the library, which has led to my current career, the library. Um, we did go on lots of road trips as a kid. Every summer or two, we would drive from the Seattle area to Wisconsin to visit my mom's family and go to like every roadside attraction and stop at every big place. So there's a picture of me and my sister and my dad uh, in the Badlands in South Dakota. We would also go to like the Corn Palace and the um, Wall Drug and the Mount Rushmore and Devil's Tower and stay in KOAs. We would, uh, we had a old Impala with black Naga hide seats and no air conditioning. And so my mom always wanted to leave the campground at like 4 a.m. before it got hot. And so she would pull my sister and I in our sleeping bags like out of the tent and then take the tent down in the dark and then put us in our sleeping bags in the car and we would continue driving. And <laughs> So we would wake up and say, what state are we in? And um, that's how we spent a lot of summers. There's a picture of me in a, an inner tube with my little sister and my mom. We're in a creek in Wisconsin. We would hang out there and um, stay at my grandparents' little cabin alongside a creek. Oh, there it is. Um, yeah, we just, we had a lot of low budget fun, old inner tubes in a creek. Um, we also went to a lot of air shows. My dad, uh, in addition to working at Boeing, then went to school at um, a community college to get an airframe and power plant mechanics license and or certificate, and then worked in a flight school on Boeing Field also. And he was a member of the EAA. We had a Cessna two-seater airplane. And so there's a picture, I think, up there of me and my sister and my aunt at an air show. We went to lots of them and also spent lots of time hanging out at small airports. And I always brought a book because my dad could talk for hours to people he did not know about their airplane and his airplane and airplanes in general and lots of airplanes. Um, uh, the picture of me down in the lower corner is fifth grade. I think I'm 11 years old-ish. Um, I tried really hard to look cool in that picture. I think that's 1993. And I felt like, like I was a pretty dorky kid in general. And so I, I looked at other people's the time. 
15 foot travel trailer and we moved into it and sold our house and gave away stuff and we just left and we had no plan. Um, my parents said my sister and I were in the gifted program and it wouldn't be a big deal if we just took a year off from school and if we just lived in a trailer and hooked it to our Impala with the black Naga hide seats and no air conditioning. Um, and so we left. And up in the top corner there is uh, the summer between seventh grade and eighth grade, 1995. Um, we were property shopping. We just drove around and we, we did end up in Idaho. We stopped in Whitebird to visit a family we'd known in Alaska. And in the newspaper was an ad for a, a new subdivision that was being split up. And so we bought two adjacent lots and were the first people up on the hill to build a house. Um, the photo in the center there is my family inside their home. My, my parents still live there um, on the hill between Grangeville and Whitebird. And we were just there on Friday. Uh, it took about 20 years between 1995, starting in 1995, to uh, get sheetrock in all the rooms and um, finish things like cabinets and put in, you know, new appliances that we either had a lot of time on our hands or we had income, but we didn't have money to buy supplies and time to build a house at the same time. So uh, my room was the first one to be finished um, because my parents decided that I deserved to have a finished bedroom before I graduated from high school and left. So I think my mom used that as an excuse to get one room finished. Uh, because as soon as then I left, that became her, you know, computer room, craft room, whatever. To this day, though, they still do not have internet or long distance or cell phones. They use a like 1-800 number calling card to make long distance. So then my mom calls me and hangs up and then I have to call her back. So she doesn't use any minutes. So, no, yeah. So, uh, oh, and the picture up in the other corner is me in eighth grade, the first year we moved to Grangeville, and I again felt totally out of my element because I had then, by then adjusted to the Seattle area and was the only vegetarian in the entire high school then, and other than the you know, Seventh-day Adventists, but I didn't know that because they didn't really make a big deal out of it. Um, anyway, so people, people didn't know what to make of our family in Grangeville. Um, so here are some pictures from high school. I think that's my junior year school portrait with the like hemp choker and eyeliner and all the stripes. Anyway, very, that's my 90s, my most 90s looking school picture, I think. And a uh, school dance my senior year with my boyfriend over in the corner there. And again, I've got like a temporary tattoo on my arm. You can't quite see it. And it's very cash. People were into like the 70s thing a lot in the 90s, like throwback. So we, we tried to look hippie-ish. And then uh, the center picture is I'm 17 and that is in the fall of 1999. It was, I used it as my senior portrait because I graduated in May of 2000. So basically the 90s encompassed all of my elementary, middle school and high school. And there you have it. The summer after that was taken, I moved to Moscow and I've been here ever since. And I joined the Unitarian Church because in the 90s, I, uh, I used to buy Spin Magazine, the like big oversized music magazine. And um, there was an article about Magic the Gathering, the card game, which I played and it was new back in the day. And it talked about like a group of kids that would get together once a week in a Unitarian church. And it was like, what is that? And my mom couldn't really explain it and it wasn't in the dictionary. And so I used the like, my new internet skills to research Unitarian Universalism and I just discovered this church. So that's why I'm here is because Magic the Gathering and Spin Magazine and I love hearing the mysteries of people's lives and 
I wanted to return here very quickly to the opinion piece by Kurt Anderson to introduce our next speaker. This is another line from that article about how the 90s were the best ever. He says, peace, prosperity, order. The American culture was vibrant and healthy as well. There were both shockingly excellent versions of what had come before and distinctly new and original forms like hip hop and, and great new television and all kinds of other things. Melissa Luna shares her story of the 90s through her cultural lens. Hi. If I had any teenage angst, it occurred in the 1980s. By 1990, when I was just about to turn 16, a sophomore at a multiracial co-ed Catholic high school in Los Angeles County, I was moving on from the melancholia of the Smiths and the Cure. The early 90s were all about party songs, like Hip Hop Hooray, The Humpty Dance, and whoop, there it is with accompanying dance moves like the Running Man, Robocop, and the Roger Rabbit. Between 1990 and 1992, I'm 15 to 18 years old. It was during this time that a TV show and two songs gave me important examples about womanhood that I otherwise wouldn't have had. Oh, that's me with my friend, Belle. So it's, the silk shirt is a very 90s thing. Um, you that want to play the only thing for. This is the opening to a show called In Living Color, which debuted in 1990 when the Fox Channel was brand new and was trying daring things. The cast of predominantly black comedians was led by Keenan Ivory Wayans, and the skit based show satirized topics like black school inequality, mass incarceration, workplace racism, and much more. And we'll, we'll get to these people that I'm about to talk to. But it was the Fly Girls who are coming up here. Um, hip hop dancers of many races, which included Jennifer Lopez and Carrie Ann and Abba, who is a judge on Dancing with the Stars, you may know her, uh, who were featured during the opening and in between sketches that, as we say today, were my everything. Young women were dancing, how oh, everyone danced at my high school to music that everyone I knew was listening to. This was not something that happened on prime time in the 80s. Rap and hip hop performances were reserved for Saturday morning on Soul Train or Showtime at the Apollo that aired after Saturday Night Live at one o'clock in the morning or on Arsenio Hall's late night talk show. So these are the fly girls. In short, in living color, took representation to the next level, and it cannot be understated what that does for a young person's confidence to see people like them and their friends killing it on TV. And they always open the door for Keenan at the end. <clears throat> Getting to the music, LL Cool J was big when I was in middle school. So when he released Around the Way Girl in 1990, I'm already fully in love with this Kangol hat wearing gorgeous man with the deepest dimple you have ever seen. In Around the Way Girl, he pays tribute to the girls from his Queens, New York neighborhood. He describes them as new edition Bobby Brown button wearing, Fendi bag having, lip gloss of shining girls with a bad attitude who are the jewels of Queens. The first line that changed my world in this song was, you're real independent, so your parents be bugging which for those who don't remember 90s slang means you're real independent, so your parents are always freaking out. Wait, hold up. You mean I don't have to do everything my parents say? This just had never occurred to me at that time. But the line that landed in my very soul is when LL raps about his roundaway girl. I tell you, come here, you say meet me halfway. This girl is her own person. She's not immediately just coming to do what you want, especially not some guy. By saying meet me halfway, she's demanding equality. You could do that? 
Having parents born in the mid-1940s, my role models for opposite-sex relationships were very traditional, with the man having all the power. I wanted to be the kind of girl who said, meet me halfway. Most people I know, uh, most people know the R&B female group, TLC, because of their song, Waterfalls. Don't go chasing waterfalls, they sing, a song about self-destructive behavior that takes you off a cliff. But it was their earlier song, Baby, 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 released just as I was graduating from high school, that set the bar for me, especially about romantic relationships. In the song, they sing, while you want my heart and all my time, well, it won't be there if you, don't, if you can't deal with my mind. Because a girl like me won't stand for less. I require plenty conversation with my sex. First off, no one was talking about sex with me at this time. I'm 48 years old, and I'm still waiting for my parents to have the sex talk with me. <laughs> so this was an adult conversation, uh, this song that I had not heard. In this song, she's setting the rules. You want to spend time with me? You want to have sex with me? I'm a whole human with thoughts and opinions, and you're going to hear those. And I expect to hear yours. And this is over if you can't do that. Dang, she's just so direct. And she's direct about what her expectations are in this relationship. There's no guessing. Again, this is everything. She goes on to sing, long as you know, that I could have any man I want to, baby, that's actual and factual. And still, I choose you to be with me and work on me, so you better not flake it up. I'm assuming nowadays they would just let, let her say F it up. So substitute that. There's so much here in that phrase. First, she's saying, I'm pretty damn great. As we used to say in the 90s, she's all that and a bag of chips. She's saying, I got options when it comes to love and sharing my life. This self-worth is dazzling. The confidence when she says that's actual and factual, she's not bragging. She has a lot to offer. And she's saying, I'm choosing you to be with me, and I'm expecting you to support my growth and to take that seriously. I still listen to these songs 30, days, uh, 30 years, 30 days, 30 years later. My, life, my adult life has been about asserting my independence, achieving confidence, requiring equality, and recognizing my self-worth. And I have a spouse that supports and respects all of it. My parents are still bugging about my independence, but that has been the cost of being actually and factually me. So I thank the Fly Girls, LL Cool J's Around the Way Girls, and TLC for setting the examples and standards that I needed as I became a woman in the 1990s. All was not well, for all, of course. There were cultural forces sowing fear and mistrust against others from working moms to kids wearing black with spiky hair. This is, some, this is from uh, Vox Magazine. This is a quote from Vox Magazine. One of the most famous prolonged mass media scares in history, Satanic Panic, was characterized at its peak by fearful media depictions of godless teenagers and the deviant music and media they consumed. This, in turn, led to a number of high-profile criminal cases that were heavily influenced by all of the social hysteria. Many who were falsely accused and ostracized are still coming to terms with it.
there's a lot of activities that I enjoyed that I felt only wrong when I did them. Such a great example would be a tabletop role-playing game. In the year of 1994, I was introduced to the world of Rift, and later that year to Advanced Dungeons and Dragons Second Edition. And for those alive during that time and knew what was going on, the, I'd have to say that the opinions on these games were rather mixed at best, and that a lot of people could not separate the fantasy and the reality. And many saw that this exercise of the imagination was one of the greatest evils that a person could commit. I don't believe necessarily that the hype was where the focus was, that what they found the most troubling about these games were the supernatural or occult elements of it. I think the games themselves and the benefits that they would give the players were a direct challenge to a lot of people in positions of authority. It seemed that a lot of officials and schools and churches and other organizations did not take well to these. And what I saw in these games was that they offered a safe space for introducing people to challenging situations where they could test themselves. You could also learn to see through the eyes of your adversaries and you could develop even a character and play the role of a villain and understand what might motivate them to think and act in the ways that they do. I think these opportunities were instrumental in helping me develop into the adult I am today. The games gave me greater mastery of tactics, strategy, and planning, and also a deeper sense of teamwork, compassion, and empathy. I believe that others wanted to teach me how and what to think, and instead I chose to explore my own mind and come up with my own answers. I wanted to start out with this positive story, well, mostly positive, and the, the good things that came for me growing up in the 90s before quickly going over some of my more negative experiences. And I didn't want to dwell on these long, so I simply made a list. I experienced a lot of verbal and psychological abuse, at times false imprisonment, theft, destruction of personal property, and one particularly scarring event was being forced to undergo an exorcism. Those who did this were people in positions of authority, and I was conditioned to blame myself for what was happening. And even now as an adult, it is hard to break this harmful thought pattern. I've spent time looking into other cases, both past and present, where people are treated this way, and to look out for reasserting moral panics. And what I see breaks my heart and often makes me feel very small and powerless. And these are the main reasons I wanted to talk about it today, that I, and that I feel compelled to keep fighting. The curiosity that led me to explore the taboo games and activities of my youth also led me to look into other faiths, philosophies, and ways of thinking. I found that most humans want generally the same things, to live our own lives, to take care of others, and to bring joy to the lives of others, to safely be allowed to live as we see fit, and that most of us don't actively mean to harm anyone. Yet some lack the courage to allow this personal sovereignty and feel the need to force their way of living on others. I know that justice is an ever ongoing process, but no matter how taxing, I truly believe that it is one of the most noble pursuits. And on that front, I've sworn to stay ever vigilant. Until it is done, amen and blessed be. I want to thank you so much for sharing that and to share it and to trust and share it with, with your new community. Thank you.
And I wish you had found a community like this when you were growing up. I mean, we're not perfect, but um, I think it was a place in the 90s when, where people growing up could, could feel safe and supported. And I wanted to share a video from Ginger Yoder um, where she talks about growing up in this church in the 90s. So. Good morning. I am Ginger Yoder, and I am the director of family ministries for this church. And I've been asked to share a reflection um, of the 90s. And this is exciting for me as it encompasses the years from when I was eight to 18. So really all of my teen years, my growing up, all that happens um, as I, I came of age. And I have some pictures that I'm gonna share on and off. And this first one is um, of my senior year in high school, um, the first day of school. So there I am in the middle, awkward haircut. I don't know how I ever thought that that was a great idea. Um, my brother next to me, and of course my dad, and I'm pretty sure my mom is taking this picture. Um, some things about me in the 90s, I loved grunge music. I shopped exclusively in the men's section. I would not wear women's clothes. I liked to wear baggy things. And um, I was an angsty, but also very outgoing teen. So it was a uh, good time there. And what's interesting also about the 90s, because I could go a lot of different directions with this reflection, is that I actually grew up in Moscow and more importantly grew up in this church. My parents started attending when I was born. The church was in Pullman at the time and then moved to the current building, which many of you are sitting in now, in 1985. So I was three when that happened. So all of the 90s, um, I am in the church and active in um, Sunday school and youth group and uh, all of the fun things that happened at that time. And one of the uh, confluences of church life in my own life was that the church purchased the yellow house, which used to sit next door to the building. And this really was just an older yellow house. And it housed our religious education uh, classes. It had some offices for Sunday school staff, and we often had meetings there. And I have a picture, a more recent actual picture of that as well. And I will share that with you. There's me again. And then here is the yellow house. Um, this was taken at Christmas just a few years ago. Now, the yellow house was um, really important to me as before we had the yellow house, all of our Sunday school classes were in the basement of the church. And of course, then all of the adults were above us. And most of my memories of this time were being told to um, use a quieter voice, not run around as much. Um, and to uh, I, we were always disturbing everyone up above. And if you um, know me, I have a hard time being kind of quiet and sitting still and um, being, and it was even worse before I was eight years old. So when we had the yellow house, suddenly our classes were in there and we could run and play and shout and fully be ourselves. So the yellow house really was the first uh, place for me in church and for the first time in my life that I really felt um, that I could run and play and shout with my friends uh, in, in this building. And that was, um, it was really, really neat. Many of the programs that we uh, had uh, at the time are still here today. Um, we had snow retreats at Puffer Butte, uh, youth rafting trips along the Snake River, and of course, we hung out a lot on old crummy couches in the Yellow House basement, which uh, was actually really, really lovely. And I have some interesting pictures of that too. I'll go back to Yellow House and then we had skiing. This was at Brundage Mountain, I think. Uh, this was at Puffer Butte Lodge. 
I believe that us three had been on a large inner tube tubing down a giant hill um, and had crashed and we were showing off our bumps and bruises in this picture, which we were quite proud of. Um, a youth rafting trip, um, which were always tons and tons of fun. And I'm kind of, I'm like the tall one in the back under the Ian Hamilton who's standing really tall there. And then of course, chilling on the couches. Now, I have a lot of really good memories of these times and a few stand out. I remember uh, staying up until dawn, talking with my friends along the Snake River while camping um, about everything from the meaning of life to, you know, simple who had crushes on who. I remember uh, taking our sleeping bags down the Yellow House steps. There were these super, super steep steps in the Yellow House. And they let us during lock-ins take our sleeping bags and just zoom down them. And we would run into the wall at the bottom of the stairs um, with surprising force. And that was rather fun. And um, I worked in the nursery and luckily was trusted with the care of all of our little children. And that experience li likely brought me to where I am today um, as your family minister. I made lifelong friends in the church. And I think most importantly, I knew I was utterly loved and cared for by the adults who volunteered their time to be with us in the Yellow House. And this really did shape my life. Church provided a stable, loving community where I could grow up from child to adult. I could make mistakes. I could be that angsty teen who loved grunge music and was always too loud. And not everything, of course, was perfect in, in my life in the 90s. I don't think any teen's life uh, is immune. Um, I struggled with mean girls and friendships. I struggled with self-image. I had my heart broken. And I also uh, made some, I dyed my hair funny colors and um, just, you know, had all of the normal teen growing pains. And it's such a gift, though. It's such a gift to be able to be given a place where you can simply be yourself. And this is what the church in the Yellow House meant to me all through the 90s, was I had a community of, of love, of, of people who genuinely wanted to know who I am, genuinely cared about me and my well-being, and, and gave me that place to explore and become whoever I was gonna become. I knew that I had a place that I was simply loved for who I was. And for whoever I was going to grow up to be, I knew that this could be, could be my home, would be my home. And I'm still here today and I still know those things. I still know that this is a place of love, and of, 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 of just radical acceptance. And that's the goal I hold for the church each and every Sunday still today. We don't have the old house anymore. Of course, if you look over to the... Um, the left, uh, the yellow house is gone. And instead, we have built this amazing, gorgeous addition that more aptly lives our mission to welcome and love every person who might want to come through our doors. And what I want as your family ministry minister is to carry out the same love um, that I received in this place to all our children and families. And so I feel extremely lucky, not only to have grown up here in the 90s, but to get to be with you here and now and bring my own son to this place to love and learn and grow. So the 90s feel really, really far away. here at church in some new ways. Bye. So I wanna thank everybody, especially the folks today who contributed to our services, our time traveler services this summer. It's been, it has been so wonderful. Um, you added so much 
we were really unsure about these services in this new place with the new technology. But I think it's really, it's, thank you so much for all that you have, have contributed. Um, it has been really wonderful connecting with old friends and new folks and, and to tell the story of the community. Um, for the final uh, worship committee service next week, because Reverend Elizabeth is coming back in two weeks, yay! <laughs> um, we are going to pass on another trip down memory lane. Sorry for the, sorry for the people from who came of age of the aughts. Um, what we're going to do instead is we're going to explore what it's like living now, uh, now in the 21st century, which you know covers a fair amount of time, but sort of more in the current where we are now. So uh, if you'd like to contribute to that, Nancy Nelson is working on that service, but you know you can find one of us on the committee and you'll hear more about that. So I, I hope that you will. I hope that you will. And if you haven't contributed yet, I hope you will take a chance because it's uh, it's a nice thing to do. So we're gonna um, watch the sung benediction and then we're gonna extinguish the chalice. Please join me in the words for extinguishing the chalice. I think they're going to be up there. Yep. We extinguish this chalice that it might glow gently in our hearts. May it light our paths as we leave this place. May it guide our way until we are together again. Thank you, everyone. Um, those on Zoom, I think, break into meeting rooms and. I don't believe we have refreshments today, but certainly you're, do we? No? Okay. But free to gather outside and we look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you.